adaptable to many situations, responsive to teaching, and with a high degree of problem-solving ability, the expertly trained Army dog has become a valuable ally to the American fighting man. Those of us who work with the Army dog in training and in combat know just how much of a friend he can be. More and more of these animals are being trained in a widening range of Army tracking and scouting skills. One thing is for sure, while the Army is not going to the dogs, the dogs are most certainly going to the Army. Between 3,747 and 4,900 dogs served between 1964 and 1975 in the Vietnam War, with roles ranging from patrol dogs to security. Alongside over 10,000 handlers from all branches of the military, 232 military working dogs and 295 U.S. dog handlers died in combat. For the dogs who survived combat, the battle never really ended. Only 200 military working dogs made it back to American soil after combat, and none to civilian life. On this Holland Vietnam Veterans interview, we interview one of those dog handlers, Bob Kernick, a member of the 56th Security Police Squadron, and his memories of his faithful canine companions and time in Thailand. Bob was born in 1953 as a Hoosier in Evansville, Indiana, to his father, a World War II veteran, and his mother, a Nebraskan. He described his childhood as typical of the late 1950s and early 1960s, but also said his family influenced the way he saw his country, God, and the idea of service, all of which would impact the decision he made the day after his high school graduation. It, coupled with the fact that uh, his brother, and his brother-in-law were also in the military. My yeah. uncle, Bob, my namesake, was a Marine in the South Pacific. And uh, my uncle, Ken, flew C-47 cargoes, planes in the South Pacific. They cumulatively, uh, not heavily influenced, but definitely influenced my, uh, my patriotism, my uh, call to duty, so to speak. Graduated from Holland High in 1972. Very next day, June 9, I had chose to be inducted into the Air Force. So mm -hmm. my sister, her girlfriend, and my wife-to-be took me to Detroit to the induction center mm -hmm. and uh, left in the early morning hours. And then that, that day, I was uh, sworn into the Air Force and mm -hmm. flew out to San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base, to mm -hmm. do my... Uh, basic training mm -hmm. and upon graduation from uh, basic went to the other side of the base to security police school security police school in late august of 72 the second week of sp school you got to forecast you got to pick five bases somewhere in there i think my sixth or seventh choice was montana and that was where the Air Force needed me. Uh, so I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Great Falls, Montana. That was a Minuteman missile base. So uh, you were assigned to either base security or missile security. And uh, missile security, there were missile sites throughout the whole state of Montana. Uh, however, I did not make it to the uh, missile security. Uh, my security clearance had not come through. I could not draw a weapon until my uh, uh, security clearance had been cleared. I had met a young buck sergeant, Johnny Southern Boy, who had just got back from Cameron Bay, Vietnam. And he told me he was a dog handler and I struck up a friendship with Johnny. And about the third time I met him, he asked me if I wanted to go out to the kennels. Uh, he had to exercise his dog from a injury and I went out there and met the kennel master. I went out to the kennels with Johnny three or four times beyond that first time and and the third or fourth time I went out there, Sergeant Livingston asked me if I wanted to go to dog school. Well, I said, well, hell yes, who, who wouldn't want to be a dog handler? Difficult uh, to get in. And so I just figured my chances of being selected were slim and none, so I didn't even pursue it. But somebody else had some plans for me, and 
dog school as the, the base needed another dog handler. And about my sixth week through dog school, I got orders that the dog that I was working with, Herman, if he would graduate, become a certified patrol dog, I would ship with him back to Montana. That really, really excites anybody when you uh, put a dog through dog school and or the dog puts you through dog school. The dog's smarter than most handlers. Then you get orders to ship with him. That's that's the cream of the cream. So that made me very, very proud. And Herman and I went back to Montana and began our canine career working the uh, bomb dump in uh, the weapon storage area in, in Montana. That was our primary job at Malmstrom. Once in a while, we would be assigned to law enforcement duties on base, but that was very rare because of nuclear threat. We had hundreds, literally hundreds of nuclear weapons in our weapon storage area, and that required two canines inside the uh, weapon storage area during the hours of darkness. We we posted uh, the dogs in the weapon storage area, and the only time the dogs were posted was from official sunset to sunrise. So in the winter hours, that was quite a long shift. I mean, you got you got your breaks inside yeah. every couple hours, but you learned what parkas were, what flight pants were, what bunny boots were. Montana, there's it's a very cold state. And to say there's a difference between a damp cold and a dry cold, cold is cold. I got back to Montana with Herman in January of 1973. Judy, who is now my wife, my fiance back then, we became engaged in September. And uh, March 3, 1973, we were married. And uh, March 4, our honeymoon was loading up my 68 Galaxy 500 XL and putting everything that she and I had together in that car. And our honeymoon was in Wisconsin, North Dakota, and finally Montana, where we had a couple yeah. days off uh, before I had to sign in from my honeymoon. <laughs> and I got back to the base and, and uh, picked up my canine activities. I believe it was in June, uh, early part of June, I received orders to Nang Kong Phnom, Thailand, which was a big surprise to me because mm. I had talked to other sky cops that had been on station at Malmstrom for over two years. And I hadn't even been there nine months. And I had orders to Southeast Asia. So to say I was surprised is an understatement. I signed out of the squadron in mid-July. My dad, my wife, brought me to Grand Rapids Airport. We said our goodbyes there. Began my 12-month venture in Nang Kong Phnom, Thailand. Halfway around the world. To say it was a long flight, yes. Yeah. Boarded the plane for Chicago, switched planes in Chicago, and ultimately flew out to San Francisco. Took a uh, military bus to Travis Air Force Base. We flew from Travis Air Force Base to, I believe we fueled in Anchorage, and then from Anchorage to Hawaii, Hawaii to Guam, and Guam to Clark Air Force Base, Philippines. We spent the night there early in the morning. Around 4 a.m., we boarded a C-141 Air Force cargo plane set up for passengers. And from there, we flew into Thailand and made several stops at bases uh, in Thailand before I think the third stop was Nang Kong Phnom. By the time I got to Thailand, flying was a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, re I remember landing at Nang Kong Phnom Royal Thai Air Force Base on a Sunday afternoon, early Sunday afternoon, as soon as I stepped onto the loading ramp, the heat just hit you like a, a slap on the face. This was September of 73, so it, it was in the 90s and the humidity. Um, the, that's the first two things I remember mm -hmm. is the, the heavy humidity, as I found out later, uh, was the end of the uh, monsoon season. Monsoon season is basically from May to September, when all you can think about is being wet and rain. There is no staying dry. <laughs> After getting off the aircraft at NKP, I signed in at the uh, security police squadron, was given a temporary billet, hooch, until my processing into the base and squadron was done. Then from there, uh, was assigned to the uh, training squadron of the 56th Security Police Squadron. We went through uh, five days of training. Uh, upon my release from the uh, training, 
with the 56, uh, was assigned to the kennels, and Master Sergeant Pace was the kennel master, and uh, he matched me up with Rex. Rex 64M6 was his tattoo. All military dogs are given a tattoo in their ear. It identifies them, their age, when they were brought into the military. Uh, we had uh, approximately 65 dogs at Non Confinam. Our canine section, GIs, was probably around 40 to 45 albeit 30 would be dog handlers. The rest would be support staff. Uh, I was assigned Rex, and uh, Master Sergeant Pace told me which uh, kennel he was in, and for me to go meet him, take him out to the uh, obstacle course, to the exercise area, and start working with the dog. So I put the choke chain on him and, and leash and took him out of his kennel, and he had been without a handler for a week or or two he'd been exercised but uh he was happy to get out and run and uh let some of his energy dissipate he was uh, about an 82 pound german shepherd probably 30 pounds heavier than the dog that i had just given up in montana mm -hmm. so when rex made a mistake or needed a correction um when you tugged on the leash you knew that there was something down there <laughs> there was 82 pounds down there you know, you, the, the loyalty with the dog is not instantaneous. You build a, a relationship with the animal. And uh, with Rex, it, it did not take long at all to build a, yeah. a good working relationship. Smart dog, um, sometimes a lot smarter than the handler. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, he, was, he was a pleasure to work with. Now having built a working relationship with his canine, Bob and Rex were given their first assignment. They were to be the first line of defense at Nan Confinam Royal Thai Air Force Base. At the time of Bob's deployment, Nan Confinam was an air base loaned to the American military for use by groups under the United States Support Activities Group, a military command structure charged with orchestrating American air activity over Indochina. To state its purpose bluntly, scholar R. Sean Randolph opined that the U.S. military presence in Thailand was the last bastion of American power in mainland Southeast Asia after U.S. troop withdrawal from Vietnam in 1973. This is how Bob recalled his mission, its history, and day-to-day -day tasks that prepared him for his long night vigil. Uh, base was uh, 230 miles southwest of Hanoi, right on the Mekong River by Vientiane, Laos. There was a communist insurgency heavily throughout Laos. There was always the threat. It was the United States Support Activities Group. There were generals from all branches of the service at that facility, admirals from the Navy, we have more brass on that base than any headquarters could dream of having. If you were a brigadier general, you were considered not much. There were there were many two-star and three-star generals and one four-star general on our base. The uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was was monitored. They put sensors throughout that trail um, from North Vietnam. It goes into Laos, Cambodia, and then back into South Vietnam and up and through. I believe 1971, our base had gunships. I believe they were AC-119s. It had 650 caliber machine guns in the nose, and that was one of the aircraft used when they received troop movement or truck movement on the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. They were uh, strafing. With that along, uh, we did have a Puff the Magic Dragon. C-130 yeah. uh, loaded with miniguns and a 105-5 howitzer. Awesome, awesome aircraft. When I got there in 73, those aircraft were gone. Okay. And uh, we were moving out of, of South Vietnam at that time. The Paris peace talks were going on in 72, 73. Mm -hmm. I believe in February, uh, Hanoi released uh, uh, hundreds of prisoners. They came home in the spring of 73. So combat operations were winding down. There was still fighting going on. We were not directly involved in it, but we were supportive to those that were. Nang Kham Phanam was the only base in Thailand that was never sappered, never hit. I like to think that was because of our good security that we had. Our areas of responsibility were 
of course, base security. So um, our resources that we were there to protect, of course, were the base, but our primary ones would be the uh, bomb dump, the uh, flight line, the aircraft communications. Our base, I believe, was seven and a half miles perimeter road. Canine teams were deployed all the way around the base, as were other security police. During the night, we had 25 to 30 plus feet towers. We called them tango towers. Our base had a very unique perimeter set up where we had triple concertina wire set up with trip flares. And then we had what they called tangle foot, which was cutting wire that you couldn't walk across. From the tangle foot, you went to another triple concertina wire fence. And then our base was the only base in Thailand in Southeast Asia that had a balanced pressure system, an alarm system, all the way around all four sectors. So if they, say they were set at 50 or 60 pounds, animals wouldn't set them off. You would have accidental trips once in a while. But basically, if a individual weighing more than 50 pounds would come in through there, it would set off an alarm in our central security control, and they would have to send out a SAT team, a security alert team, to investigate why that alarm went off to yeah. make sure it wasn't a, a sapper yeah. coming through the wire. And everything from the second set of Constantina wire to about 30 yards in back of the Tango Tower, maybe would be uh, 150 feet, it was all sprayed with the defoliant Agent Orange. Nothing grew in that area. And that's the area that we walked through to get to our post. Uh, yeah. So all the cops that worked on the perimeter and dog handlers were exposed to Agent Orange. I haven't had any of the telltale yeah. diseases uh, that many of my uh, buddies have had, uh, such as neuropathy uh, in any of your extremities, uh, tendonitis, uh, many types of cancers. Yes, I've been very fortunate. If I remember correctly, our work schedule was seven days on, two days off, six days on, one day off. You were with the dog a lot. The dog required certain maintenance, uh, grooming uh, that you couldn't do or didn't do while you were working. I was with a, a bunch of good guys and, and we took a lot of pride in our dogs where we would go out quite often on our off days to the kennels and uh, bathe our dogs, uh, groom them. Once a month they had to be dipped. This is nasty. We had to put them in a tank of melathion. Melathion is a very toxic chemical. It's used, it used to be used uh, by farmers for insects and uh, kept the ticks, the parasites yeah. and, and that off of the dog. But it was toxic. You just can't do that without having some adverse side effects. And I'm sure there were numerous uh, cancers that were caused by this, but we didn't know any better at the time. We do now. So we learned from our mistakes. All the dog handlers lived in one big hooch, kind of like a barracks, an open air barracks. The deuce and a half would pick us up at our uh, canine barracks, loaded up in the deuce and a half, and then we went to uh, central security control where the guard mount was conducted where the armory was, drew our weapons and ammo, slap flares, and received any uh, intelligence briefings, threats in the area for the night. And once in a while, they would throw a, an inspection to make sure that your mustache, your hair conformed with 3510, the military standard. I remember one uh, guy on our flight, uh, a straight leg. He was a security cop. Always had a great big hat, and he had high high sidewalls. Flight chief, tech sergeant, ordered a hats off inspection that night, and Murphy's eyes got big, and he took off his hat, and his hair hit his shoulders. <laughs> the captain was there, and the captain directed the the sergeant to uh, make sure that man was in conformance with 3510 at 0800 the next morning. <laughs> in my thoughts, they were all pretty much the same, but a hard day would be during the monsoon season. There was no possible way for you to stay dry. You just learned to live in wet clothes. We were fortunate. We spent our eight hours on, on site in the rain and loaded back up in the deuce and a half, and we could 
shower when we get back to the, the hooches and put on dry clothes and mm. hit the rack. But the monsoon season was the most difficult time of year. The dog handlers kind of stuck to themselves. We lived down the hill away from the rest of the sky cops. We were not so much loners, but yes, we were. We did have friends, you know, individual friends that were that we hung with. But usually the dog handlers, when they went to town, went to the movies, they went with three or four dog handlers. We were a, a tight group. We had Thai guards assigned to the 56th Security Police Squadron, and some of the Thai guards were were dog handlers. We had probably uh, 65 dogs in our kennels, and half those dogs, approximately half of the dogs, were handled by Thai guards. Thai guards were paid by the U.S. government to help with the security of that base. Mm -hmm. We were a guest in Thailand. This was called Non Confinam Royal Thai Air Force Base. It run by the Americans, but we were a guest there of the Thai government. There was no status of forces agreement with the Thai government, meaning that we could not take weapons off base. If our dog caught an alert, which Rex did one time, uh, we had to radio it into CSC and they would uh, make contact with Thai Army, Thai Air Force, and they would have to go outside the perimeter and check where the threat came from. We took care of any threat from the fence line onto the base. Uh, the, the ties were responsible from the perimeter fence into the jungle. I was with another dog handler after Rex caught the alert. I radioed in the alert and uh, they dispatched Thai Air Force and about 15 Thai's Air Force personnel went out with with weapons from the front gate, half a mile from the front gate to my sector, and they had more lights and made more noise. So anybody that had come up to the fence line, whether it was Uncle Ho or or uh, a farmer or whatever, they were gone by the time that uh, High Air Force, they said, uh, no threat, no threat. Ah. With the commotion that you made going to it, it's no wonder. He was, he was the early warning system. And you read your dog's alert. You get to know your dog. You know whether he's alerting on an animal or a human. Hundreds of snakes out there in Thailand. And dogs would alert on, on snakes and lizards, animals, you know. Anything that's out of the, out of, uh, the ordinary, the dog's very intelligent. I was in the bomb dump on, uh, during the monsoon season, and there was a structure, open, open walls, and, but it did have a roof on it and a backdrop of wood. And Rex and I went in there to keep dry for a while after patrolling through the, the dump and Rex would not sit. He was mildly agitated and he, he kept on wanting me to, to look at the back wall and the, the structure where we were in is 12 by eight feet. And I went into my, my uh, MSD can and pulled out my flashlight and shined it on the back wall there was a three-foot lizard on the wall that Rex was uh, telling me, come on. I said, we walked in the rain the rest of that night. I wasn't going to stay in there with that. Neither was Rex. So for the most part, it was you and your dog. Uh, however, you would meet up with another dog handler. The way they had their, our post was it was a GI tie, GI tie. They felt that by spacing them out every other, that you wouldn't get three or four ties or three or four GIs in one one spot and leaving the others voided. You went out to your post, you quartered your post, you 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 cleared your post, made sure that there was nothing out of the ordinary there, and then you just uh, became vigilant. Every so often, you know, uh, uh, you would get up and you'd quarter your post again. Um, mm -hmm. There was no set period that said you have to quarter your post every 45 minutes or every hour and a half. You knew what was right. After a long, tense year of guarding non-confinam, Bob was finally issued orders to return home. But first, he had to say goodbye to a beloved friend. Maybe received my orders around May of 74. My orders were to Wartsmith Air Force Base, Oscoda, Michigan. Happy and sad. Uh, well, it, it was... It was the day I left, yeah. I probably had a noonish 
flight and I got in a taxi cab, a Thai taxi, told him to take me to the kennels. I was in my 1505, my traveling uniform, went out to the kennels and went into his kennel with him and hugged him and said goodbye, knowing it would be for the last time. Well, he was more than just a, a dog. He was, he was my friend and confidant, my buddy. Out processing, making sure your orders were right, getting your, you could only carry so much mm-hmm. on the plane. You would take a C-141, we called it uh, Freedom Bird. Not the Freedom Bird when it's coming in, but when it's leaving with you on it, it's the Freedom Bird. From NKP, uh, we made one or two stops at other bases, picked up soldiers that were uh, departing. We flew to Clark Air Force Base. Spent the night and uh, boarded another, another aircraft in the morning. Mm-hmm. Made our way back to uh, Travis Air Force Base, back to the airport. Got home in September of 74, and I separated from the Air Force in June of 1976. Shortly thereafter, uh, NKP, all bases in Thailand, closed down. Uh, NKP was one of the last ones. With his time in the Air Force concluded, Bob became a police officer in Holland, Michigan, where he still lives to this day. Though retired, his memories of non confinam tie intimately to the heritage of the 56th Security Police Squadron and to the memories of his faithful canines and fellow service members. We were the 56th Combat Support Group. Uh, therefore, we were the 56th Security Police Squadron. It became deactivated upon NKP closing. Years later, reactivated at Luke Air Force Base, became the 56. So there is a direct connection between NKP and Luke Air Force Base 56 Security Forces Squadron now. Our, our unit lives on and they redid the kennels there. When they redesigned the kennel building, they have a special room, the monsoon room, in honor of Nam. Bob remained and remains actively focused on remembering his unit's history and its actions in Southeast Asia. With the advent of the internet, Bob became interested in recording the history of his best friend in Thailand, Rex. Though, like so many other military working dogs in Southeast Asia during this time, Rex himself became a casualty of war. It is this very fact that keeps Bob focused on retelling the story of Rex and gives Bob a deep respect of all military working dogs and all of their dog handlers and their time in Southeast Asia. You ask what happened to the rest of them. Uh, For the most part, they were euthanized. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were considered a piece of equipment, expendable. It's a very, very sad part in our military history, but it is a part. And I know of, uh, personally, of at least six handlers that have their own dogs now uh, that they worked with in the Air Force. It's it's, uh, wonderful. Of that... 3,000 to 3,500 dogs that were deployed to Southeast Asia, they are credited with saving 10,000, at least 10,000 lives. Civilian, military, there's no distinction as to how many of, of each, but a life is a life. And those dogs served with honor and distinction. They are not forgotten. It is with this heartfelt compassion for his canines and military heritage that Bob continues to walk in the footsteps of their memory. He believes the nation is taking a more active role in remembering the military working dogs and their handlers of yesterday and today. How to get involved, one may ask. By visiting your local War Dog Memorial site and supporting groups responsive to the needs of handlers and military working dogs today, such as Old Dogs Supporting Young Pups, a favorite of Bob's. In regards to these efforts and to his own, Bob said, And how do I feel? I am deeply honored to represent these canines. One of the proudest moments in my career was when I became a dog handler. And one of the saddest days is when I left. Very proud, very honored to uh, have Rex and and the other 3,000 plus dogs recognized. We are doing that more and more today. Michigan War Dog Memorial in South Lyon is it's a graveyard that went neglected for 20, 30 years. About eight years ago group of individuals got together along with uh, two German Shepherd Clubs in the area, local VFW, American Legion, 
and spent several weekends clearing away the overgrowth, exposing these graves. Some of these dogs were from World War II, Korea. They uh, done a very, very nice job of reopening that memorial and bringing forth the uh, war dog memorial for the Vietnam dogs. I was, was and am very proud to have served in the Air Force and very, very proud to be one of the few, the chosen dog handlers. It's uh, quite an honor to be amongst such good people, past and present. If they needed me today, I'd, I'd go, and I know I'm not by myself. Was I always this way? Was I always this way? 